I'm delighted to welcome Becky from PGRO today. Good morning, Becky. Good morning. Uh, so Becky is going to give an independent view on how to get the most from spring beans from establishment through to harvest. Becky's going to give a 35 to 40 minute presentation and then we'll dive into your questions. And as I mentioned before about Slido, to use that function, please just type Slido, S-L-I-D-O, into your mobile phone web browser and enter the code BEANS21, which you can see at the bottom right of the screen. So that's it for me for now. Thank you and I'll hand you over to Becky. Thanks, Jane. Um, and morning to everybody that's watching this morning. Um, I'm going to talk through um, the background really and sort of basics for spring bean production. Um, I'll also give you a little bit of information about potential markets um, and we'll go through as much as we can really in the, in the next 40 minutes um, as there's quite a lot of information obviously available and, and to get through this morning. So when we look at area and production for spring beans, well, field beans in general, actually. So these figures that you can see here are area in 1,000 hectares, volume of harvested production and yield. Um, up, up to 2019, the figures are, are from DEFRA statistics and the 2020 data are from provisional statistics from Eurostat. So we can see that um, area fluctuates on a, a roughly sort of seven to eight year cycle. Um, and in the last four or five years, you can see from the red line at the top, which is yield, that yield has been quite um, variable as well. Um, and we'll talk about some of the issues around yield variability as, as we go through this presentation. So at the moment, we're in a sort of uh, roughly between 500 and 600,000 uh, tonnes of, of beans produced per annum. When we look at end uses, the majority of our beans, certainly in 2020, went into the animal feed market. So um, that's that's a good market. Most beans are not grown on contract, um, apart from seed, of course. Um, we had a smaller quantity of beans that went into the human consumption market, which is traditionally one of our sort of key target markets for field beans. Um, but we need really good quality beans, good colour, light colour and also low brucid damage. And that is one of the subjects I'll talk about a little bit later. The brucid damage is perhaps one of the things that prevents field beans going into the human consumption market. There's also a, a growing market for salmon feed in, in Scotland and Norway. And we have a few novel uses as well, or developments for uh, bean fractions, which include beer and also bread as well. Some baked products um, are exported field beans of good quality go into Egypt and the Middle East into Formadam, which is almost like a, a baked bean stew and um, falafel. One thing I do like to do really, I suppose, when talking about beans in general is to talk through the benefits and the rotation. I think it's really important and certainly from our point of view at PGRO, we would always say consider it as a rotational crop and not always just as an individual crop. They can give good returns anyway, but they have huge benefits in the rotation that should also be considered. It is beans are a source of homegrown protein. Bean protein content and grain content can be 26 to 30 percent protein. They're a nitrogen fixing crop. Um, they don't require uh, mineral nitrogen fertilizer at all. Um, and in fact, using that using N on bean crops can uh, uh, prevent nodulation. So um, the other benefit, of course, is that they give um, a benefit to the following crop, and that can be anywhere between 0.6 and 0.9 tonnes per hectare. So keep that in mind. It's, it reduces inputs. They can reduce energy use and CO2 emissions in a rotation, and they do improve soil structure and microbial populations. There are other non-end pre-crop benefits, from, um, uh, such as P and K, and as I said, the gross margins of legume rotations can exceed non-legume rotations. And this is really down to the lower inputs and the positive pre-crop effects. Of course, one of the key benefits is this break that we get in disease infection in cereals and oilseed rape. Um, 
and it spreads the workload. So drilling dates and harvest dates can be slightly different, which might help in terms of um, operations on farm. So many growers are growing beans for use in animal feed on farm, um, either as a silage product or as crimp grain. And often the benefits there are, are greater because we've got um, the return of nutrients in the manure onto farms. So, And of course, they do provide great benefits for pollinating and other beneficial insects, particularly bees. So a quick review of the 2020 season. Um, I mean, going back to that a graph showing the, the yield fluctuations that we've seen, particularly in 2020 and 2018. I mean, a lot of that's down to the weather, of course, and that, that's something we can't really do anything about, but we can help put beans in a position where they can tolerate difficult weather conditions better. What happened in 2020 was we had this very wet autumn in 2019 going into the winter, and then it dried up very rapidly in March and April. Um, so winter beans weren't drilled, spring beans were drilled, perhaps slightly later in some cases, and um, some winter beans were drilled in the spring as well. Um, and the issue then was that, that conditions became very dry. So you can see from the picture at the bottom right hand side there, um, establishment was quite patchy in some cases, not all, but in some, and actually quite uneven. So we did tend to get a second wave of establishment when we got a bit of moisture. Um, so that causes a few issues. Um, it's possible that this wet autumn and winter again in 2020 to 21 might lead to a greater area of spring beans in 2021, although some winter beans have been drilled at this point. So, so just to consider the, the, some of the factors really that then um, will help us to sort of overcome some of these issues really and some of these stresses in beans, who are, which is a, they are a moisture loving crop. So um, but there are other factors to consider as well. So rotationally, you should not be growing any legume more than one in five years. Um, and, and that's largely for disease management. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, foot rot management in particular. Although they don't necessarily require a fine seed bed to get good herbicide efficacy, of course, the level seed bed is, is required. For drilling depth, optimum depth of drilling is about 10 to 12 and a half centimetres, so approximately three inches. And that is really to keep, get them deep enough so that the herbicide damage doesn't occur, for instance, also so that you haven't got your crows and rooks pulling them out, um, but not so deep that establishment is slowed down. So I think you, you want to be making sure that they're going into good conditions. Some people are using mintel and direct drilling, um, but you do need to make sure the seeds are well covered and that there's good seed to soil contact um, and that you're not leaving open slots. We do emphasise this last point on this, this particular slide is wait for the right conditions. Don't force spring beans into difficult conditions. It just isn't worth it. You'll, the, the impact of that can be very great on um, establishment and yield. So if it's cold and wet, wait for as long as you can till the right conditions occur. Um, one of the factors that really impacts on how field beans perform is compaction and soil structure. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more as well about some of the results that we've seen from the Yield Enhancement Network and from a project that we've been running for a couple of years, a bit later on in the presentation. But compaction reduces root development and penetration and can have significant effects on yield. You can see from the picture at the top right there what happens, of course, and this isn't just beans that do this of course it's, it's any crop really if you've got significant compaction the bean the roots go sideways and of course that means that when we do have years like 2018 and 2020 where moisture deficit is quite high um, they're not able to get access to the moisture it does also lead to to water logging of course when rain falls high as the, as the water is not able to, to percolate through the soil so um, although beans can tolerate wet conditions, they don't like to be waterlogged for long and it will cause long term damage to the root system and, and yield impact. So it's really important to get soil structure right when you start. Um, and it does have quite a significant impact on soil borne pathogens, particularly the foot rot pathogens in beans as well. So any poor soil structure can lead to great, greater pressure on the plants, really, 
and, and greater disease infection. So really important to, to have a good soil structure. For specifically really when we look at the foot rot infection, we're talking mainly about fusarium here, and you can see the impact it can have at the base of the root there in those pictures. Um, and plants fail often and will will. We've talked about soil structure and rotation, so just to emphasize those need to be, the soil structure needs to be good, rotation is one in five, and conditions at establishment need to be good. There's a few other factors that you might consider. Cropping history, so if you have a long history of bean production or legume production, then you are likely to have a higher pathogen burden in the soil. And so you may want to think about extending rotations in, if that's the case, and particularly if you're seeing foot rot infection in beans regularly. Conditions during the season are difficult to mitigate really because we have had some really hot spring and early summers um, and when the plants are under high stress conditions we do see greater disease pressure from the foot rot diseases as well as other diseases so I think just going back really to getting them into the right conditions to try and help reduce the pressure before we even get started so prevention is important because there's no chemical control for foot rot diseases in beans or peas. When we look at establishment a bit more, um, sowing and seed rate, uh, optimal sowing time is really, I suppose, up to the end of March. Um, for some people, it could be later if, they're, if they have good soil moisture retention and perhaps if they're using direct drilling, for instance. But we would probably say late March. Once we start to get into April, we do often see yield declining. Um, when we're planting in April. Seed rate generally is 50 to 55. You should be targeting 50 to 55 plants per metre square. Um, and if you're on very fertile soil types, then 40 plants, drop it back to 40 plants per metre square. And this gives us the, op these, we know from previous work that these give us the optimum economic yield for beans. Um, and we have a good tool that can help calculate that, which is the OptiBean tool, which is available on our website. Um, generally allow about 5% field loss when calculating a seed rate for spring beans, although sometimes we don't see any field losses. Um, and you can use the PGRO app actually for more information on agronomy in general, but also there's a seed rate calculator on the app. If you don't have the app, although I would strongly advise you do have it, um, this is the, the, the um, calculation that you can use to work out seed rates in kilograms per hectare. Quick update on the uh, PGRO, <clears throat> what's now the Pulse Descriptive list. Uh, many of you will know, I think there's been quite a lot of publicity around the change from the recommended list to the descriptive list um, in 2021. Just um, to say really firstly that the, the number of trials that we're doing has not changed and the amount of data that we're generating to go into um, providing the descriptive list is exactly the same, if not slightly better, I'd say actually. The reason that we've changed to a descriptive list is to give a bit more flexibility about what characters we can include, how we can keep some varieties on the list, um, you know, and, and use other characters to keep them on the list. And um, so I think this, this is, a, is, a, is a positive move, actually, for PGRO and for growers. Um, and you can see there, this is a good list of spring beans um, in 2021. Um, so everything is carrying on the same in terms of trials work. We've added a few characters and particularly you will see there um, in the middle of that table, roughly, uh, we've got a column for rust tolerance. So that's that's been the first time that that's gone onto the spring bean list. And that's that's useful, actually, in terms of um, determining which varieties have got rust, a bit more tolerance to rust. Um, all of the information from the descriptive list. So it's on a downloadable um spreadsheet from the website but also it this information is available on the PGRO app again a good reason to have the the app for seed quality um this is really important and we've seen some decline in seed quality over the last two or three years partly due to conditions at harvest so very dry hot conditions at harvest that might have led to some physical damage to seed but also of course brood damage and at very high levels, and so we're not talking, you know, 10% brookid, we're talking at sort of 40% plus brookid damage, then it can have a start to have an impact on germination capacity. So important to get seed tested for germination, particularly if you're farm saving, 
bought in seed will be tested and the you're looking at 80% or more really in terms of germination capacity test for stem nematode stem nematode is um a seed and soil borne pest it's what you can see on the bottom left there actually is the microscopic um, nematodes free living and in the seed they are desiccated in a desiccated form that survives for quite a long period once they're in the soil they can survive for up to 10 years there are two species Ditalenchus gigas is the one that mainly affects beans and does cause the most damage to bean yields and also to quality of the seed Ditalenchus dipsaki is it has a wider host range than gigas um, but doesn't really affect beans in quite the same way that that gigas does um, but it's something that needs to be sort of borne in mind really across the rotation. There isn't any treatment for this pest, uh, although we are doing some work um, with a student at Harper Adams to look at the use of cover crops or fumigant, biofumigant cover crops to help reduce levels in soils, which is looking quite positive. Um, so it really is a case that it needs to be screened out at the seed stage. You shouldn't be planting seed that has any nematodes in it. Another disease actually which doesn't quite affect spring beans as much as it does winter beans is Ascochyta farbi, but we don't have any seed treatments to control this. So it's important that we test for it and that we don't use seed that has more than 1% Ascochyta. We talked a bit about physical damage and moisture content and the impact that that can have on germination. So important to keep that in mind as well. <clears throat> the important thing about moisture content and physical damage as well is that when you move, every time you move seed, you can lose you can lose germination capacity. So every time you move it, if it's very dry or damaged, 5% germination can drop off. So important to keep that in mind. Weed control. Um, you can see we've got a good, good number of uh, pre-emergence products in spring beans. Um, Nirvana is a good broad spectrum product um, and then some of the others give additional control of certain weeds. Bazagran, which is Bentazone, is our only post-em product so it's important to make good use of pre-em products um, and use Bazagran when necessary. I've included the next slide um, really to just give you an idea of the spectrum of weeds that each of those products controls. And we have an excellent weed expert at PGRO, and that's our, our, my colleague, Jim Scrimshaw, who um, can give you any information you want about rates and um, specific weed control for, for these products that we've got. Um, and one thing I did want to talk about, which is, um, is, is the Bentazone stewardship guidance that we, that we have at the moment. Um, Bentazone is an active substance that's found um, widely in surface water and is the active substance most detected in groundwater. Now, um, we use the stewardship guidance because um, if we do not reduce levels in groundwater and surface water, we are, it's very likely that we'll lose bentazone as a product. And as our only post-emergence product, it's really a valuable tool for us for legumes. So the rules are really look for groundwater in, in high risk zones, you've got drinking water, groundwater safeguard zones or groundwater source protection zones one and two. So establish if you're in one of those zones. Maximum dose is a thousand grams of active substance per hectare and really only used from April in the spring and early summer. If you're on in those high risk areas on the shallow sort of um, light soil types, then you shouldn't be using it at all. And in all other areas, try and avoid use on those shallow soil types. For surface water, really, I think the guidance is looking at heavy rainfall. If that's likely in the next 48 hours, then avoid use. Um, of course, avoid use when drains are flowing and do use buffer zones to help prevent runoff or spray drift into, into water courses. It's really important that we that we follow these guidelines um, because I, th I think we, we could lose the product if we don't. It isn't... Um, it isn't an option to increase water treatment capacity. Um, so I think just important to keep this um, in mind when using Bazagram. For black grass control with a spring crop, of course, um, we've got the opportunity to follow stale seed beds and to control weeds before we drill. Um, later drilling can help um, in the spring with black grass. And there are a few products that may have some low levels of activity, but we don't, of course, have the products that we have in winter beans to control blackgrass. So 
um, it does need some careful management. So I'm going to move on to diseases now. Um, and um, we have a few key diseases. There are more diseases, but these are probably the ones that are going to affect you the most, apart from foot rot, which we've already discussed this morning. Um, chocolate spot um, is probably the one you're most familiar with. Rust we saw last year and downy mildew is one that spring beans are affected by. And um, as you can see from this slide, the yield impact from those diseases can be quite significant if it's not controlled. So I'll talk through each one individually and just give you a bit of guidance about how, how we can manage these better. Chocolate spot is a cool wet weather disease in the, on, in the main. Um, it starts with small chocolate coloured spots on the, on the leaves and then gradually as, as, as the disease progresses, it becomes much more aggressive and can um, cover the whole leaf area and defoliate the plant. So if, if you get early infections with this disease, then it can cause some significant yield impact. But in spring beans, we, we usually don't see quite as much impact from the disease as we do in winter beans, although in high disease pressure, we, we, it can cause problems. And we have had a couple of years where we've had wet conditions in June and, um, and that's led to some quite high disease pressure. And of course, it can also affect the flowers and hence it can affect pod set. So that's really how it's affecting yield. So preventative sprays are important when you know that you've got conditions that are going to be suitable for chocolate spot development. So it's the wet weather. And also if you start to see the small spots, then you really need to take action um, quite quickly. Um, spray, the, the critical timing, and this is the one not to miss really, is the first pod timing. So that's the roughly mid flower timing. Um, and then a second spray three to four weeks later, which you could combine with your rust control. And we'll talk a little bit more about rust in a minute. So we've got good active substances available for chocolate spot management. We've got azoxystrobin, boscolid and pyroclostrobin, which is signum, cyprodenil and fludioxinil, which is switch, and then some more generic products like meconazole and tepiconazole, which will control chocolate spot. And I'll show you a little bit of data in a minute about how these compare perhaps to what we've had in the past, which is chlorothalonil and cipriconazole, which is the ultra elite type products. So for azoxystrobin, there are some clear disease responses to dose rate for chocolate spots. So the lower the dose, the, um, the less disease control we see. Signum gives very good control of chocolate spot at 0.7 kilos per hectare. And it's a product that I, we would strongly recommend when you're under high disease pressure. It's a really very good chocolate spot control product. And as you can see, although this data are from, um, these data are from winter beans, it gives a really good yield response um, and good chocolate spot management. So um, a good product. Azoxystrobin plus tebiconazole um, gives good control of a disease and a good yield improvement as well versus untreated plots in these trials. And then we looked at Alta Elite within this trial as well, all these trials, and um, saw that it, although it gives a sort of good lowish level of chocolate spot control, and a lowish level of yield, it, it, it can give some effect. But actually, what, when we look back at the data, we can see that Signum and, and the other products that we've got give actually much better control and better yield. You can only use tebiconazole once um, in a programme, and I'll talk more, more in a, about the programme after we've talked about rust and down in mildew. Um, and just check harvest intervals, of course, don't, don't get caught out by those in these hot, dry summers. Bean rust is a warm weather disease. It develops rapidly later on in the season when we have hot days and cool humid nights. And we've seen last year certainly quite high levels of rust in, in beans. Um, and as I said, we would include a product for rust control in the second application that you're putting on to spring beans. So again, there's a good choice of products. Tabiconazole is very good. So it might be that you would leave your, your tabiconazole application to the second um, second spray in this case, but azoxystrobin uh, is also very good. Signum can be good. I think um, it's, it wasn't ever sort of sold really as a rust product, but it can give good control. Um, but you may want to select tebiconazole or azoxystrobin for rust. And you can see here um, that um, there are some varieties that have slightly better tolerance to rust 
These are only one year's data, though, so just be a little bit careful. We will continue to evaluate rust where we can, where we have good disease levels in, in the trials and, and update the list, of course, each year. For downy mildew, um, downy mildew is a cool, humid weather disease. So we tend to see it sort of earlier around that sort of early flowering timing, I suppose, in crops, in spring bean crops. It mainly affects spring beans, not really winter beans, although we do see it a bit in winter beans. It's not a major issue, really. And there is a, a tool called Crop Monitor, which is available um, through this link, um, which shows risk through the season from approximately beginning of April throughout the season. So that might be a useful tool. Um, we do have a product which is a metal axle M straight foliar product called SL567A, which gives a really good control of downy mildew. And it is the only one that gives control of downy mildew. So um, you might include that in a program where, where you have downy mildew as a problem. But what we do have for downy mildew is some long term data about resistance to the disease. And we can see there we've got two. So the higher the, the rating, the better the disease um, resistance. So on the list for 2021, we've got Lynx and Yukon that's showing really good tolerance to downy mildew. Mara Speed has been on the list for donkey's years, um, still showing good tolerance to downy mildew. And then anything of five and above really is, is not too bad. So do have a look at the descriptive list for information about tolerant varieties. So when we look at our fungicide programme overall, it's likely that you're more likely to be using a two spray programme for spring, spring beans, possibly only one if the conditions are, are, are good and don't favour disease development. But two spray programme would include chocolate spot as your key target at that first pod stage. So signum, or you could use azus oxystrobin plus tebiconazole or metconazole or switch. Um, and include SL567A if downy mildew is present on 25% of the plants. T2, rust is probably your key target with chocolate spot. So again, you might choose to leave the tabiconazole to that second application to control rust. When we come on to insect pest management, um, it's we have a few key pests again, and I'll just talk about a few of them really. Pea and bean weevil is the earliest one that you'll see. It overwinters around the field margins of your previous year's crops, moves into crops when temperatures reach approximately 10 to 12 degrees, and it's walking into the crop from the field margins. So you'll see the effect on the field margins on the edges of the crop first. There's the weevil notching around the edges of the leaves, um, but that's not really causing the main damage. The damage is caused by the larvae feeding on the root nodules. So the weevils lay their eggs um, and the larvae get washed into the soil and um, feed on root nodules as they start to form. There's a really good trap system available for PMB and weevil monitoring, um, available from Coppet UK. They should be going out really in February as temperatures start to warm up um, in, in this early spring stage. Um, there's five traps per system. They should go onto the field margins of the previous year's crops. If you don't have a previous year's crop, then obviously put them on the margins of your current crop. Um, or where you're planning to put your spring beans. Um, and they need to be checked three times a week. They're a fer it's a pheromone trap, so it's attracting the weevils into the trap. The threshold is quite high, actually. So it's 30 weevils average across the five traps. And then once you've reached a threshold, you should spray when you've first seen signs of weevil notching in the crop. And particularly if the crop has emerged in the last 10 days or is likely to emerge in the next 10 days, those are the crops that are most at risk. Um, and it, the reason that we're saying monitor more carefully now and use this trap system is because we know that there's reasonably widespread resistance for weevils to pyrethroids or at least partial resistance on farms. And, and therefore avoiding use of those products as we don't have anything else is really key. So use the trap systems to help you make these decisions. Aphids, um, there are two really that affect beans. P. aphid is, is likely to be the one that is transmitting viruses into the crop earlier on in the season. Black bean aphid forms large colonies later in the season. It can transmit a few viruses, but tends not to be, that tends not to be its main sort of damage form, if you like. It causes damage by direct feeding and also 
the honeydew that's left after feeding by either aphid is leads to increased levels of chocolate spot in the crop. So P. aphid likely to be transmitting viruses into the crop. And there are a number of bean viruses, all look quite similar, um, but can do quite a lot of damage to, to yield. I'll talk about insecticides after I've sort of talked through the, the key pests, really, because um, if we can talk, have a look at a programme of insecticide use. Um, aphid management is difficult. But there are some biological control agents that are available. So you can buy ladybirds and predatory wasps, and there are some organic surfactants and plant extracts that are available for aphid management in beans. Um, but really, we should be starting to look at the use of um, non-crop areas and field margins to encourage our natural enemies. And we have seen years where we've seen really large numbers of, of ladybirds, particularly, and hoverflies in crops. And it's really very important that we encourage these to, to help reduce aphid issues. Um, there's some research in, in Europe that indicates that intercropping might be helpful to provide barriers or dilution and, and also to cause changes to the crop microclimate. So that might help with aphid infestations as well. For brookhead beetle, um, you all know, I suppose, what the damage is, um, is from this pest and it causes this damage to the seed that you can see here in the slide as the adult emerges at harvest time, at dry harvest. Um, they again, they're overwintering around the margins of your previous year's crops, particularly, I suppose, in the larger trees under the tree bark. And they are a later flying pest. So they will be moving into crops from April onwards and particularly into flowering crops where the females need to feed in order to become reproductive. They can survive on other plant hosts on, on plant pollen, but they don't really become reproductive on other pollen. So, um, and once they're in the crop, they start to lay eggs as soon as the pods form on the bottom of the plant. And that after that point, they're not, it's not possible to control because there's no really systemic products that control the larvae. So um, it's important to, to manage this pest as an adult. So our current recommendation is to spray when the maximum daily temperature has reached at least 20 degrees C for two consecutive days and when the crop is at the first pod stage and then apply a second spray seven days later. Some of you may know that the um, Syngenta PGRA Brookie cast system has been taken down now. Uh, really, from discussions about that, that tool, um, we, we decided really that it was not quite as useful as it could be. It was giving predictions to spray every day, effectively, during the period of risk, which is May and June, which isn't really the message that we want to give growers. So um, you currently only have pyrethroid products available to manage this pest. You need to space them out at seven days and check labels for flowering restrictions because some of the pyrethroids are restricted during flowering. Work that's been done in the past shows that um, not only angled nozzles give good penetration into the crop, and it's important that you do this, but Lecler ID3 gave the best penetration to bottom leaves. Water volume, stick to two, as close to 200 litres as you possibly can. There's no benefit to going higher than that, but really dropping water volumes is not a good thing to do. It doesn't give you good coverage of the crop um, and it will reduce the efficacy of the products that you do have, which are, again, quite limited at the moment. So when we look at insecticides, um, you can see that we've got really just pyrethroids and pyrimicarb. Um, for pyrethroids, if you are using them to manage brucid, then you should, you should not be using them during the daytime. You should aim to use them in the evening or very early morning. Um, whilst bees are not foraging. Um, and there are a few that you can use during flowering. Do check harvest intervals and the number of applications that you've permitted and maximum dose rates, of course. For aphids, the, the, the key aphicide that we have, of course, is pyrimicarb. Um, and we can only use it once. So if viruses are your key issue, it's possible that you may decide you need to use this earlier. However, if, if that's not the case, then you would preferably save this for your large colonies that are causing feeding damage. Pyrethroids at best give partial control of aphids. We hope to have new products into the crops, of course, but um, at the moment that's, that's not looking immediate, certainly. For harvest um, aids, uh, at the moment for beans we only have glyphosate. It's not 
a desiccant. It is a weed control product. So, um, and, and in most cases, if you've got weed free crops, you shouldn't really need to desiccate as the leaves will fall during ripening. So, um, and, and glyphosate doesn't have much effect on the stems anyway. We had last year Spotlight Plus on an emergency off label approval. We just we don't quite know yet whether we'll have it again for this year because you can't use glyphosate on seed crops, of course. So you do need another product in seed crops um, for harvesting fit to combine at 18 percent moisture content. Um, but wait until only a few stems are green. If you're long term storage and you're looking at um, moisture content of 14 percent. Quick word about the Yield Enhancement Network. Um, we, we're encouraging people to join the Yield Enhancement uh, Field Bean Yen and also Combining Pea Yen. So anybody that's growing Combining Peas as well, please do join, join the Yens. Um, they're not competitions in our case, so the Pulse Yens are not competitive. What they are is a benchmarking um, facility for growers, really. We've had 39... Field bean entries in 2020, 32 returned yields. And you can see on the map there the sort of approximate um, location of those. So we've got a reasonably good distribution. We could do with a few sort of a bit further north as well, of course. Um, and so we've got a total of 52 over the two years, mostly, well, more spring beans than winter beans at this stage. So please do enter yen. I'll just give you a bit of an update on some of the results that we've got from Yen as well. So for spring beans, potential 2020 grain yields were generally in excess of 11 tonnes per hectare. Uh, some of some of you I know probably won't be getting too close to that, but some people are, you know, seven or eight tonnes per hectare. So they're not too far, too far off that. Um, we have sort of preliminary associations with some of the things that we've measured and particularly the soil and foliar nutrition sort of um, aspects. So but also the physiological ones. So the length of the growing season is important. The longer the growing season, the higher the yield. And then obviously, of course, some of the other factors like shoots, pods and seeds per shoot and thousand seed weight and harvest interval are associated with higher yield. So similar in some ways to the cereal um, results. And you can see the map here on the, on the right hand side um, showing um, potential yields across, across the UK. PGRO, we did um, also a bit of uh, more detailed work on 14 of the sites across two years um, where we were using, we were working with hummingbird technologies who use um, drone flights and, and satellite data to monitor NDVI, which is um, a measure of canopy health and, and cover um, and co-funded by Innovate UK. And these formed the basis of the um, yen in the first year um, and we've collected a lot of data actually from from these trials so some of the general comments i'd say at this stage are for soils yield was positive positively associated with high ph increased soil organic matter content and improved soil structure so it's really backing up what we we know but also giving us some some good data to show that these factors are really important both for spring beans and winter beans. There are other significant associations between soil nutrition that was measured and yields. Some are quite weak and we need to look more closely at those and probably to look at them in, in, in more detailed trials. <clears throat> um, for foliar nutrients that were measured, there was a really positive association with increased potassium levels. And one comment I'd make about that, I suppose, is that it is something that we see coming through our lab, um, through our plant clinic more frequently. As potassium deficiency. So we saw stronger responses in 2020 than 29 to our measured nutrition levels and I think that's because there was a much greater stress on plants in 2020. We did some preliminary work to look at earthworm numbers and we found a strong association where we had high levels of earthworms, yield was higher and in fact the site with the highest earthworm count was in the top 25% of the yen crops. I'm nearly, I'm nearly done, coming to the end. So um, just to say thank you very much, everybody, for turning up this morning and for listening to me. Um, it seems like a quick whiz through everything about spring beans. For further information, you can talk to any of us at PGRO. There's myself. I can <clears throat> talk to you about um, pests and diseases. My colleague Leah is our pathologist. <clears throat> and my colleague Jim Scrimshaw is our herbicide and weed control expert. And Steve Belcher will, will give you advice on varieties and, and more general agronomy. These are my 
direct contact details, the PGRO phone number there. We do run an advisory service all year. So you can talk to us at any point in the year, email us at any point, and we have a plant clinic that runs the whole year round. So please do send your poorly plants to us. That is free at the point of contact. So we can give you a diagnosis if we have to send it to another lab for virus and virus diagnosis, for instance, or nutrition, then we'll make a charge for that. But for most things, we can give you a result and we can do that for free. The seed testing laboratory is not free, but obviously we strongly encourage people to have seed tested if they're farm saving. Everything else you can find on the website or talk to us directly. And that's that's me finished. So I think I'm going to hand back to Jane and the, the guys at the technical end and um, take questions. Thank you very much, Becky. That was a fantastic uh, whistle-stop tour of uh, how to grow spring beans. I know there was an awful lot to cover there. So, so thank you and thank you everyone for your attention. We've had um, some great questions through on the chat, which I'll get to in a minute. If you've got any questions um, that you'd like to add to that, again, please either use the chat function if you're logged in or use Slido. Um, just type that into your phone or um, an alternative window with the code BEANS21. Um, so Becky, a couple of these questions came sort of before you got to that topic, but I'm still going to ask you them anyway, and then you can just do a recap um, and elaborate a little bit more. Um, so first of all, this was a pre-submitted question that we had via the registration form. What is the single biggest thing growers do wrong when establishing a spring bean crop? Poor nutrition, drilling dates, seed rate, or something else? Um, I think there's there's probably a couple of things, I suppose. Um, we talk, I talked a bit earlier about not pushing them into difficult conditions. I think it's tempting sometimes to try and get them in to get to, to, to make sure that you're not hitting that dry period that we generally see in April and May. It's really important not, not to push them in too early into cold, wet conditions. Um, but of course, you can go early if the conditions are right. So it's not, you know, we don't have a calendar date, really. We don't say stick to a calendar date. Um, nutrition, no, I'd say that's probably not the key, the key problem. Um, not always, anyway. Um, soil structure, really important. And I've emphasised that quite a few times through the talk, really. That is probably the key factor that needs to be got right in order to have a successful crop. And that applies to all crops, of course. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, just uh, linked to that. So you talked about the effects of compaction on beans. But what about the benefits of beans on soil structure? Are there any? Yes, there are. I mean, <clears throat> beans obviously can be quite deep rooting crops. Um, they they send their roots down to, you know, roughly a metre, I'd say, and sometimes more. Um, and they, they're quite strong rooted, you know, when they're when they're healthy crop anyway, certainly. So I think the, there's that benefit to soil structure of having a deep rooted crop. Um, and and obviously they can improve microbial populations just because of that sort of nature of the, the crop itself being a um, a nitrogen fixing crop. So, okay, thank you. Um, so a nutrition related question now. Just thinking back to the first one. Do you have any work uh, trial work on sulphur, um, and is it worth adding to the seed bed? This person has a bit of polysulfate spare, and they were thinking of doing a split field trial. Uh, with 0, 100 and 200 kilograms per hectare of it. Yeah, um, we have looked at sulphur. Yeah, definitely. Um, we find it, we don't find very much, very good responses to sulphur, I suppose. We did look at polysulfate as well. Um, I think the, the reason for that is that we're not seeing at this stage much in the way of sulphur deficiency in, in the crop. Um, and it's certainly not something that's come through our plant clinic. As I said, the trials that we did didn't show any responses. I mean, I think it's definitely worth a try if you think that you are suffering from sulphur deficiency, then yes, of course, do try it. Um, <clears throat> the, other, the other thing that we I looked at actually, I guess it was a question that was sent through beforehand, was the yen data and also the hummingbird data that I was just talking about. Um, I had a quick look through that. So even in sort of reasonably lowish soil sulphur areas, um, there, there don't seem to be any, any deficiencies in the plants from any of those trials over two years. So we're not seeing sulphur deficiency. I think we need to be <coughs> somewhat careful because um, 
the, 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 the guidelines for nutrition levels in foliar samples particularly are not necessarily set for peas and beans and um, they're set for other crops. So, um, but at this stage, I would say we're not really seeing sulfur coming up as an issue. We're seeing potassium coming through definitely, but not sulfur. Okay, so potassium, the, the one to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm just going to do here. So, um, this was another pre-submitted question that we had uh, via the registration form. Uh, what do you consider the best herbicide programme on heavy soil where the key weed, weed burden is black grass, charlock, hedge mustard and groundsel? Yeah, so I had a good chat with my colleague Jim at PGRO about this as well. So he's, uh, he's, he's, he's given me a bit of advice about this too. Um, Defy will give you control of Charlotte's pro, pro sulfur carb of Charlock and groundsel um, at four litres per hectare, and then the centium at uh, about 0.25 litres per hectare can will help with the hedge mustard particularly, um, and possibly a bit with the groundsel. Nirvana is a good broad spectrum product, of course, um, which includes Charlock and groundsel, um, and but you'd need to add clomazone again for um, hedge mustard, and then. If necessary, bentazone as a follow-up, really. Um, the, 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 the issue with blackgrass is we don't really have any products for, for blackgrass control. So, um, again, you're going back to sort of using um, stale seed beds and spraying off before drilling um, for blackgrass management, to be honest. So. Okay, thank you. Um, so this, this came in before you, you got to this point, so if you can just recap on it um, and then add to it. So do you have any work on row spacing and seed rates? Um, yes, we do actually. We've done a lot on seed rates in spring beans, and hence why we've got the recommendation for target plant population for 50 to 55 plants per square meter. I have to check actually the row spacing stuff. Steve's done the work definitely, <clears throat> and it's possible that he's. I think he'll have written that up and put it into one of our magazines. So um, if if we can <clears throat> take some details, I can send you the references to the to the work that Steve's done in terms of row width plant spacing um, and some of that work was also done in octobean as well of course a few years ago which led to the change in the the plant density recommendation i do actually have a name for that question so um, oh good okay we'll follow that up then brilliant um okay uh, another one what is the optimum planting depth so talked about this a bit i would say approximately three inches 12 12 centimeters 12 to 13 centimeters and we, the reasons are, I suppose, are around the sort of a not causing any damage from herbicides. Pendomethylene is one that can lead, to, particularly in wet conditions, that can lead to a bit of crop damage. It's usually not permanent, but it looks difficult to start with. Um, obviously, crows, rooks, pigeons will pull out seed that is too shallow. Um, but the other on the on the other side of the, the argument, of course, is that if you plant them too deep, you plant them so deep that they get, they're too cold and wet that they can't establish very quickly and you can't germinate, there's a possibility that some might rot. So that's, we'd say, about three to four inches. We had, had a follow-up question on that, actually, saying sort of which is it, three, three or four, because I think 10 to 12 centimetres sort of equates a bit closer to four. It um, does. Yeah. Three to four inches. Yeah, so it's, yeah, yeah, it's four... I suppose it is actually, isn't it? Four inches. I don't work in inches, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we should work in centimetres. Yeah. So 10 to 12. 10 to 12. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then a couple more questions on here. So if you do have any more, please do feel free to add them. Um, so we're getting towards the end of the questions now. So um, are you still doing trials on starter fertilisers and have you found any benefits? We are doing, yeah, we are looking at starter fertilisers. Um, it's uh, it's difficult actually to find a very good impacts of, of these sort of nutrient products, but we continue to look at them. Um, there was a lot of done work done in peas in particular, actually on phosphate a few years ago, which was done sort of directly pre-drilling, which showed really good influence on on growth. Um, but we we just keep. We keep trying, really. I think um, we'll report any significant findings when we when we get them and um, continue to do it. 
um, and, and look at any new products that are coming along as well. Um, I think there are a couple of new ones that we'll be looking at this year. So and we'll report on findings as we get them. But I think that there's a bit of variability about, <coughs> excuse me, and how effective they are and on the conditions, of course, that um, uh, lead to, to them being more effective. So I think that's just need for further work, really, on that, on that point. And a P and Bean Weevil question um, now, uh, which I think you partly covered earlier, but if you could just recap uh, and then expand. So what is the best spray for P and Bean Weevil and uh, the timing? So yeah, um, P and Bean Weevil, we only have pyrethroids. Um, we know now that there's at least partial resistance on many farms across the UK. So you really should only be using products when you absolutely need to enhance the use of the, the threshold system and the trapping system um, traps need to go out now really in preparation for weather warming up hopefully next week um, and, um, uh, and and start to monitor for movement of pmb and weevil um, the crops that as i said emerge have emerged in the last 10 days so not, there's probably not many spring green beans in the ground yet i would think because it's been too wet or or crops that are likely to be emerging in the next 10 days after you've reached that threshold of 30, an average of 30 across the five traps, those are the ones that are going to be at most risk in terms of larval damage to root systems. You probably, I would say if you apply a spray when you see first notching, when you've reached a threshold, what I would say is if it, if it doesn't work and you're not seeing any control, don't do it again. It's not worth it. You've obviously got resistance on the farm and it just simply isn't worth it. The other thing I would say about weevil management is that if it the, the damage often, we, we don't always see many yield responses. I suppose that's what I'm saying um, to insecticides for weevil. The only time really that we see any yield responses is when we have very high other pressures on the plant. So if we're running into very dry and hot conditions, the combination of those conditions with weevil damage onto the root nodules can then lead to greater yield impact. So it's, it's, it's sometimes I think if you're if you're not getting good control with pyrethroids, just stop doing it. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, we've had uh, a new question come in here. What soil temperature would you suggest waiting for at the three to four inch uh, drilling depth? <laughs> um, yeah, I, was, I, I did have a chat with my colleague about this the other day. There isn't really we don't have a sort of recommended soil temperature for for um, beans they're not likely to grow very much below about 4.4 degrees C. Okay. Um, but th there's a very small amount of growth below that. Um, but we, we don't really give a recommended, obviously the warmer the soils are in the spring, the more quickly they're going to germinate and establish, assuming that you've got a good moisture availability. So um, you, we, we, we don't give a specific temperature, but do you know, just be aware that below about 4.4 degrees, they're not going to grow very much. Okay. Okay, so mindful of that and of course the moisture. Um, yes, yeah, definitely. I don't think that's going to be a problem just yet. But um. Yeah, great. Um, our final question now, and this was one of the pre-submitted ones. Uh, so if you've got any last minute questions, anyone, this is your chance to get them in, if not, this is the last one. Uh, so I struggle with header losses when combining. Is there any evidence of a pod stick type product helping to reduce this? Um, a little bit. I mean, bean pods are are quite tough pods aren't they and once if they do spring open then of course that is uh, that it's it does cause a few losses but um we have looked at pod stick type products um and generally i'd say the results are a bit variable sometimes good sometimes not so good so i think um there's not really any clear data about how well they work in beams um i mean header losses i think part of the part of the issue perhaps is that the increasing size of combines now so large headers with not much flexibility on uneven ground so um we did have some data from peas of course that shows that um if you're harvesting into the sort of direction of lean of the crop then you tend to get slightly fewer header losses now that might also apply to beams although if they're not lodging at all and if they're standing straight then um less likely to be the case peas tend to lodge more than beans perhaps and that was a brilliant segue there, Becky, because speaking of, of peas, we have a Combining Peas webinar coming up uh, two weeks today on the 18th of February, same time, 8 or 9. Uh, so we'd love to have you back uh, for that. And there'll be details 
coming out on, on how to register, but it's, this, it's the same platform to view that. And that, that will be joined by Dr. Leah Harold from PGRO. So I think that is about it from us. So it just leaves me to say thank you very much to Becky for joining us today. And thank you to the audience for tuning in. Hope you found that useful. And if you do have any uh, further questions, uh, be sure to get in touch with either ourselves or PGRO. Those details provided earlier. And uh, PGRO and us will be happy to help. So I think uh, that's it. And we hope to see some of you at the combining, beam, uh, combining P webinar in two weeks time. Thank you very much.